You're listening to a CNA podcast. Hello, everyone. Crispina here. Today, it's just me chatting with a guest who is dialing in. If you hear a lot of the ambient noise, it's because she's dialing in from a hotel in Singapore. She's American, but in Singapore for somewhat of a whirlwind trip. I'm talking with Linda Rottenberg, the co-founder and CEO of Endeavor. It's an organization that invests in fast-growing businesses. I also like the title of her book, Crazy is a Compliment. Linda is in town for a speaking engagement at Yale and US as part of their President's Speaker Series. Welcome to Singapore and to work it, Linda. Thanks for taking the time despite all the technical hiccups. Yeah, apologies for this, yes, Hotel Muzak, uh, but it will accompany <laughs> our conversation <laughs> as if I'm having tea with you. So it'll be, let's exactly. make it work. We have to be agile here. And Indeed. it's wonderful to be back in, in Singapore. Linda, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but when I go through your resume, your work history, and my immediate reaction is that, oh my God, this is such a high bar. You know, it sounds like you are one extremely busy woman. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, when you alluded to my book, which is titled Crazy is a Compliment. So I guess... Let's start with the fact that I co-founded Endeavor 26 years ago, and we started in Latin America. We're now in countries across Latin America, Asia, Middle East, Europe, Africa, US, wow. Canada. But back when I was founding Endeavor, saying that there were high growth entrepreneurs that were worthy of investment and mentorship and attention and networks, everyone called me crazy. So I was known as Chica Loca, the crazy girl. And now it's pretty obvious that there are entrepreneurs around the world and worthy of investment. Although I know we're a little bit on pause here in the region, but nonetheless, so looking at forward. And you mentioned Yale and US. So I am the mom of identical twin girls who are 18. They're in their second oh, wow. half of their first year at Yale University as under, ah. undergrads. So even though I went to Harvard undergrad, they much preferred Yale. They're, th they're ha very happy there and happy that I'm about to speak at Yale and US later. Oh, okay, great. So today I want to focus on something that I've seen pop up in my social media feed recently. And so I thought you're the best person to ask about it. Something called executive presence. This author, Sylvia Ann Hewlett, she's a Cambridge educated economist yep. who wrote a book called Executive Presence, right? So it's basically, if I could just summarize it, something like a magic sauce of a strong leader. It used to be confidence, pedigree, charisma. She tries to distill what executive presence is and what's needed for a new leader now. The, so the original one in my mind is like, yeah, your bank CEO, right? A white guy in a nice suit. <laughs> But, yeah. but things have changed, right? Things have changed. Like with hybrid and Gen Z, people expect new things out of their leaders. She says people who can read the room, who are inclusive, who listen to learn something authentic. I don't know, which is why you probably see CEOs in sweatshirts. What do you think? Look, it's hard to disagree with the fact that there's a welcome change in that rather than just being the authoritarian leader that's just strong by showing no emotion and KPIs and then firing people well, that there is this sense of listening and empathy and there's yep. a lot more attention across the board on mental health, I think, of employees and wellness. Yep. And I think Gen Z is looking for purpose and looking for mission and looking for inspiration leaders. I think that's Terrific. And I welcome that change from what you were saying of the stern white guy in the suit. But I guess I recoil a little bit when I hear what executive presence should be and that there's one type. I think that's the trap we fall into. And I think of Elizabeth Holmes, the now disgraced founder of a biotech company who tried to wear Steve Jobs like black t-shirt and make her voice lower because that's what an entrepreneur looked like or everyone who right. copy the hooded sweatshirt of Mark Zuckerberg. I think that we need different role models who don't try to all sort of fit into one mold. And, and I guess for my own life experience. I've been an executive now, a founder, entrepreneur, but also CEO. I've, we have 600 full-time employees and 2,500 entrepreneurs that I work with. And I guess I had this misconception that I had to be 
kind of tough and show no vulnerability and to be respected. And then what happened was I'm not only the mom of these identical twins, but when they were three, so 15 years ago, my husband got a very serious cancer diagnosis. Only a hundred people in the world had had this form of bone cancer. And I basically took the year to make sure I still worked, but I went to every hospital appointment, every chemotherapy treatment was there for my girls. And when I I came back to the office, this was, I was working from home before obviously Zoom. And when I came back, I thought, okay, I need to show I'm strong. So the team feels confident that they can follow me. And instead I I, I broke down. I just, I I couldn't help it. Someone asked me a question and several people on my team looked at me and said, you know what, Linda, we always thought you were superhuman, but like now that we see you as a real person, we'll follow you anywhere. And so what I learned from that is we all have to be a little less super and a little more human. Mm. That's my personal leadership lesson. I love that story. It sounds really dramatic, Linda, for you to like know who you really are because something terrible happened to you. Yeah, well, yes, I think everyone needs to take things to the extreme, but I think it was a lesson of, hey, I can be myself and yeah. I am a passionate person and I am someone who's not going to be all buttoned up. And the people, that was what they wanted to see from me. They want to see other things from other people who have different styles. Sure. And I think that yeah. to me, that's one of the reasons why Endeavor focuses on the what we call the role model effect. And mm. I think that there is no one right entrepreneur, or there is no one right leader. And I think that when we showcase people, not only of different backgrounds, but different leadership styles, I think that's really important because I think that the fallacy is that we all have to fit into Into, one mold, whatever the flavor is, whether it was the stern kind of army sergeant, and now it's the empathic, you know, cuddly person. I don't think either of those extremes are, are one size fits all. Oh, I totally agree. Okay, you must sit in many top-level presentations, right? When you're looking for businesses to invest in. So you must see a lot of CEOs, founders, young, old, women, men, etc. What is your litmus test? When you see someone and you say, okay, this guy I'm going to invest in. People have to be able to tell stories. I think that... Mm -hmm. When we're looking for entrepreneurs, we're looking for people who have seen pain points and problems, and they're trying to solve those problems at scale. Right. And even if you have a tech company that you think is complicated, your job is to make it simple. Mm-hmm. And your job is to simply explain what is the problem you're trying to solve? What is the need you're trying to fill better than anyone else? And why should people, whether they're employees or investors or customers, come along with you on the journey? Yeah. That's it. The simpler, the better. I mean, Disney's mission is to make people happy. And I think people who cannot break their story down and try to think that the more complicated it is, the more they'll sound really impressive. I think they make a mistake. That's the number one thing I look for is, can someone tell me a story that's not only compelling so that I want to follow them, but why is this leader solving this problem? What drew Mm. you? Make the connection personal. And I think that everyone wants to follow, you know, back to the human. I want to know why, what drew you to solving this? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because public speaking is a really big factor for presence in a leader. I think we can't run away from it. I would say that some people have that in spades. Okay, Steve Jobs, for example. I mean, that guy didn't need a teleprompter yeah. or a PowerPoint slide. He didn't even need notes. Come on, how many people can do that way, right? You're right. Somebody who can connect with me, just talk to me yeah. simply and try to tell me what is it that you want me to know wins half the battle, right? Exactly. And I think that having worked around the world, what I would say about this region in particular in Southeast Asia is sometimes there is a prize on being humble Mm. and respectful and not tooting one's own horn. And I think that there is a way without being ego-driven to 
show people why you're so passionate about this mm -hmm. idea, about your company, about your people. Find something, even if it's not self-aggrandizing, yeah. that you can draw people to. Because I think that sometimes when we look at founders from Southeast Asia versus those from Latin America or Europe, the others are coming in almost overly marketing, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. They have the opposite problem. I always tell the Argentines, okay, a little less, yeah, less is good, <laughs> but here a little more is, is okay. And I think that's what I would say to people. If you're worried about seeming egotistical, then find a different way to shift the focus to your customers or to your employees or to your shareholders, but get people excited about what you're doing. And even if you're an introvert, which is totally fine, I've seen wonderful founders and leaders who are more introverted. But I think that, again, yeah. finding a way to make that connection then and draw people in. Quiet people can lead, but they have to find a way to then draw people in that works for them. But I'm just wondering, in this part of the world, English is not really like a first language. So maybe being articulate is quite a challenge for some people. Do you think that this can be learned? To be able to communicate honestly, authentically, can it be learned? I think people can get better at it, yes. My husband is a writer, written seven New York Times bestsellers books. He's still alive, I should say, 15 years cancer-free. Wow. And he is a, a wonderful public speaker. And his three TED Talks have reached several million views and he's been on television a lot. But he actually went and got lessons from an, an acting coach and to learn how to be a better speaker right. and learn that sometimes going quiet actually ah. pausing and shifting and not being all one note is actually even more helpful. So I do think it's learned, but back to the English speaking, it's funny because we have one, a gaming company founder in Vietnam was very nervous because he was going through an Endeavor selection panel where he was going to have to pitch on Zoom to six VCs and entrepreneurs and people who were going to judge whether he would join Endeavor. And he said to me, I'm very nervous. I don't speak English that well, but his passion for this gaming and music company combined, and you saw the guitars in the background, and it flew off the table. Everyone loved him, and it did not matter that the words were not always perfectly phrased. You could feel his belief in energy and the numbers told a good story, and he was the favorite person on the panels. Wow. I'm just going to wrap up. Maybe one last question, Linda. Okay, 10 years ago, authenticity wasn't on anybody's list, but now it is. Apparently, this new generation of people, they don't want some brushed up models saying the right things, etc. But I think there is a conundrum here because most people have a carefully crafted presence, especially online, right? You can't just shoot your mouth off. I mean, these things have a way to come back to you. So... What do you think is the most difficult thing about crafting a presence? Well, I think you just put it perfectly that there's a dichotomy or a conundrum, as you said, that on the one hand, crafting a presence is what we're expected to do online, in quotes. And then we're told at the same time to be authentic and authentic and crafting seem to be antithetical. First of all, I think, as I said, we, we need more role models and different types of role models. And it's not just their background. It's not just the gender diversity or the ethnic diversity or geographic diversity. I think we need diversity of all types, including temperament and style so that people will understand that there's no right way. Mm. So I think the way people craft their a profiles is just basically looking at what got the most views by someone else. And so by definition, everything feels like a replica yeah. of a cut and paste version of what's on trend at the moment. Look, I think the work people need to do, and I think getting to know oneself takes a lifetime. <laughs> so yeah. I think that's hard and that's scary for people. And I think, especially as a mom of young girls, I see them struggling with, well, people like the real me. You know, if I'm authentic yeah, yeah. and they reject me, then they're rejecting me. Whereas if it's a persona, they're not rejecting me. They're rejecting my persona. I can deal with that. So I think oftentimes people put on that persona, people craft that image so that they won't have to feel the personal rejection. And so what I would say is that entrepreneurship, leadership, 
friendship, dating, anything, Mm -hmm. you are going to get door slammed in your face. You are going to face rejection. Mm -hmm. You are going to make mistakes. You are going to hit bumpy times. What is this period but bumpy times? I'm here in Southeast Asia. No one can get funding anymore. People who are top of their game are now told, sorry, you can't grow anymore. You have to be profitable. Mm -hmm. So I think that what people have to realize is that is the norm. They're doing nothing wrong. Right. The volatility, the occasional rejection, the occasional missteps is part of the journey. And I think if people realize that, then maybe one false move or one rejection won't sting quite as hard. That's where hopefully we need to get to. What do you think? Because I think people are afraid of being canceled or they're afraid of being rejected. And that's why they put on these kind of personas that are that seem to be all the same. Do I think that people are worried about being cancelled? Oh my God, absolutely. In Singapore especially, it's so small, right? So when something goes viral, it really goes viral, like everybody knows about this. So people become really, really careful about what they say. Yeah, I think we've become so risk averse. We have to figure out how not to be just blind and hurtful, but I think without being so cautious that no one's really speaking what's on their mind. Yeah, but I also think it's because of the response we're getting, right? Sometimes you say something which on paper sounds perfectly okay to reasonable people, it sounds okay, but then it's taken to mean something completely different. I don't know. It's so polarizing. Yeah, look, my hope is with Gen Z who came up on WhatsApp, who came up digital first, that they help all all the rest of us learn new norms. The problem is the old norms don't really work in this every minute on world. And yet we have not figured out new norms. So my hope is that this is this uncomfortable, awkward period before kind of the next generation figures it out. I always have these conversations with my girls like, it's not that difficult, mom. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? It's not that difficult to not say anything that's going to get you canceled. Please give me a break. <laughs> wow. Easy for 18 year olds to say what I say. <laughs> one last thing. The one thing I would say, you know, I'm about to go speak to, speaking of 18 year olds, I'm about to go speak to college students, right? Yeah. At Yale and US. And I just had the pleasure of meeting with 30 recent grads, many of whom were starting entrepreneurial careers in venture capital, careers in creative field. And I think that what is hopeful about this difficult period, right, is that I think when everything is up and to the right and everyone is building and everyone seems to be getting money, people are saying, wait a minute, what's wrong with me? If I'm not one of these rock star people who are just getting everything and getting all the venture capital or starting a business, what's wrong with me, right? And I think right now where it's kind of the opposite and the pendulum swung yeah. too far. And I think everyone now feels very negative <laughs> about what's going on. I think I've been the most positive person here in Singapore the last week. But <laughs> people are saying, okay, wait a minute. Maybe it's not so scary to start. Maybe I need to start out being profitable. I don't need to get money. Maybe this crazy idea I had, I can, I can try. Uh, and I think that this weird sense of people coming down to earth and valuations coming down to earth, it, it seems scary in the moment. And and yet it actually gives that next generation coming up, I think, more confidence mm. that they're not doing something wrong. It's going to be hard. So they have a yeah. little bit more realism because it was always hard, <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm very hopeful that we're really going to see people trying things out and taking some risks and worrying a little bit less about the repercussions because they've seen other people fail or, or you know raise down rounds or, or or whatever it is and sort of say okay yeah. and they they're still standing they're still surviving i think we need more of that yeah. i think people who come up in downturns actually end up doing much better over the course of their career right so that's right. what i would say to the young people listening this is actually the best time to be starting something new it's the best time to be heading out in the workforce i know it seems probably scary and probably people aren't hiring or aren't hiring at the crazy sums of money that they were a couple of years ago. But just know that everything happens in cycles. Yeah. And right. And so be there for Absolutely. the long term. So that's my little yeah. pitch to those graduating. Yay for the positivity. I also feel it's cost correcting. I was looking at some of the insane amounts of VC money that was raised and, and salaries that were paid. Yeah. I think in a way the system is cost correcting. 
which is not a bad thing. So, well, let's see how it goes. Thank you so much, Linda, for coming on. It's quite an impossible feat for one person to tick all the boxes, as Linda so rightly says. If it were up to me, I'd pick um, somebody who would I follow. Somebody with character, does he do the right thing? Somebody who can communicate, does he speak simply, as Linda says? And charisma, come on, if you're going to be right at the top, You've got to have a little bit of the X Factor, right? Thanks to my guests and to you for listening to Work It. I appreciate all your notes and comments and messages. And of course, to the CNA podcast team. Till we meet next week, have a good work week, everyone. 